while I was at that larger firm, Fagri, I, I had a case where I was representing a, a guy exactly my age who was on death row. And his name was BJ, uh, a black guy from Alabama. Uh, and no doubt in my mind that he was on death row because he was black. And clear of the closing doors, please. What up, son? What up? Grind and pivot, pivotal moments that changed everything. Louis Max here in Queens, New York. Today, I have the honor to welcome a former superstar distance runner before he became this shining star in United States politics. Yes, a guy whom I'll call a real mensch. He's in the house straight out of one of the great cities of the United States, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm here. I'm stoked. He's here. Mayor Jacob Fry. Mayor, how are you? Louis Max, I am honored to be here on Grind and Pivot. Thanks so much for having me. I am beyond pumped. I'm, I'm so happy that you're here. And, and I'm glad that you picked out one of my favorite ties for you to, to wear today on this beautiful uh, May afternoon, I think. That's right. right? That's Absolutely. right. Carolina Blue. Carolina Blue. Not going to say, you know, I might be a Duke fan, but we're not going to say anything. Right. So you and your city uh, have been at ground zero with the tragedy of Joy Floyd, George Floyd. Um, what have you learned? Uh, anything new about people's thoughts of empathy, compassion, and respect for, you know, common human decency. What, what, what's it like out there? Well, anyone that hasn't learned a whole lot, both about themselves as well as about their community over this last year is lying, um, or at least is not doing enough introspective work. Uh, you know, I have found over this last year that Minneapolis is an incredible resilient community. It is, a, it is a city of extraordinary and beautiful people. Uh, and simultaneously, it is a city that has its work cut out for it with respect to racial justice and healing. Uh, there's no disputing what happened. I mean, it, the courts have determined that uh, George Floyd's uh, murder was just that, it was murder. Uh, and since then, our city has been grappling with all of the areas where we have come up short. Uh, whether that's economic issues or police reform, you know, all of the above. And my hope is that we are able to kind of channel all that anger and energy and pain into, into something productive here. How's it going? Is it working? Have you taken baby steps? Do you take two steps forward, two steps back? What are, what, what are the um, obstacles, if you could, you know, briefly discuss, because we're going to get into a couple of things. I'm not really going to get political with you. This is not what it's about. I want to promote the city in its best, best light. But, you know, what are those obstacles in a nutshell, if you could, if you could kind of briefly talk about it? I mean, there are obstacles throughout. Um, you know, it's not one policy or one reform. And, you know, I could get into a litany of the changes that we've made, but, you know, that's really not the subject matter here. I mean, look, it's, it's racism. It's some of these structural and institutional issues that have plagued cities for generations at this point. Um, it's, it's having to recognize that, you know, there's not just one lever that you pull at city hall and suddenly everything's better. And there's no magic wand that you can wave to suddenly correct all of these issues. It's, it's gotta be like this fully comprehensive approach, uh, which is why I'm, I'm hoping that, that this moment, if anything, is recognized for its magnitude and that people are galvanized to make the true change that we need. Fantastic. Uh, well done, well said. You know, a lot of people probably don't know a lot about you um, since you're not really you're not a native mini uh, for not not a native from Minneapolis. Uh, let's Minneapolitan, back. what they call it. What do they call it? It's called a Minneapolitan. Minneapolitan. Not. Okay. Yeah, like not it. as easy as a New Yorker. You know. No, yeah. not as easy. Okay, Minneapolitan. I kind of I like it. Okay. Yeah. You know, you're from, and we let let's be fully transparent here as I speak to you for the first time. You yep. know, in this kind of setting. Uh, 
Jacob happens to be my nephew, believe it or not. So he's part of my family. And right. um, I know that I know for a fact that he was, uh, you know, brought up and, and born in Virginia on the East right. Coast. So let's go back to Virginia where uh, you were, let's skip ahead and you were a star high school athlete, a runner, a distance runner. And if nobody knows that, um, they could check that out for sure. There's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff written about it and documented. But um, were you in? Uh, were you involved in any other sports prior to uh, getting into the heavy duty running? Yeah, before I was a serious runner exclusively, as you know, Uncle Louis, I played both soccer and basketball. So it was kind of a combination of the two of those. And at some point, you know, I always realized that uh, my passion was going to be in running. And I know that was probably a little bit of a disappointment for you since you are, you know, the AAU basketball coach ex extraordinaire. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I don't know if I've ever told you this story, but about my final basketball game that I ever played. No, uh, no, I don't, I, you know what? I mean, uh, I, I didn't even know you actually played soccer. I definitely knew you were, your brother could definitely play soccer. You've yeah. been on the courts. All right. You want, you know what? Enlighten us. I, I could I could shoot. I'll tell you what I had. I had a pretty sweet jump shot. You may really? not recognize it now, but um, no, I. Uh, so I, so in my last basketball game, summer league, summer league, and I was I was playing for you know Fairfax Police Youth Club at the time, uh, kind of select basketball, and um, we were playing Damatha. You know Damatha? Oh, Damatha's heavy duty, absolutely. Yeah, very heavy. Duty. Morgan They're, Wooten, yes, absolutely. Oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Joseph Forte. I mean, this was a team. And so we were playing the math as what I believe was their freshman team at the time, but this was summer league. And before that top guys on the freshman team got brought up to both JV and varsity. So, you know, I don't know this to be the case, but I was told that Joe Forte, who ultimately played for UNC was on this team at the time. Uh, and so, I, so I was already, I was already thinking, you know what, my, my basketball career is coming to an end. I think I'm better at this running thing. That's where my passion lies. But nonetheless, I was in the game and I was dribbling up the court and I go to fake left and I and pass right. And this kid with these huge, thick rec specs, remember rec specs? Sure. Yeah. She, so he intercepts the ball and takes off down the court. And I, of course, chase after him. He was about my size and I'm not all that tall. <laughs> uh, and I go up to block him. He dunks on me. I mean, dunks on me. This kid that couldn't have been more than five eight. I don't know, five wow. seven. Yeah, yeah, dunked. And at that moment, I thought to myself, you know what? No matter how hard I train, no matter how hard I work, I will not be able to dunk the basketball like this kid just did. And I looked over at the coach and I say, "Yeah, coach, that's enough. Take me out. <laughs> I'm done." That was the last play that I ever, that I ever participated in for basketball. And from then on, it was all running all the time. I love as you it. Recall. I love it. Absolutely. So, so yeah, yeah, you did, uh, you were quite a runner. Um, did you know immediately that, uh, running this running was something that you were good at? Um, and it was, or was it something that came gradually? How did that work? Well, I, I knew right away that I was good at it. I also knew right away that I had an aptitude for, working my tail off, uh, perhaps more than other people did. My talent was not that I was all that fluid or even necessarily all that fast, uh, but that I could was able and willing to work harder than the other people standing next to me on the starting line. And, and I thought that was a beautiful thing, you know, this direct correlation between hard work and success. Um, and I mean, you, you, you knew me as a kid, I was crazy. You know, I mean, the, the, the amount that I would put in and the effort that I would put into running was was pretty ridiculous at, at times. But it also led to, you know, I won the state championship and, um, you know, got a scholarship to college and ran professionally. And uh, it led to any success in that area that I had. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you were quite, quite successful and you were definitely uh, passionate and dedicated by, by all means, you know, the train was there, there. I remember there was a lot of training to do. Correct. Um, did you have, you know, how much coaching was involved? Was there a mentor or was there any, anybody along the lines that, you know, said, to, you know, was kind of guiding you at the, on the, at the early stages? Yeah. I always had mentors along the way, you know, early on, it was this guy actually at camp up at Brant Lake. It was uncle Merle Norcross, not my true uncle, but, uh, 
you know, he was a track coach himself. And I think his whole purpose was to just make sure I was having fun with things because I had the propensity to be a little bit too intense, even when I was 10 and 11. Um, and then, you know, later I had a series of track coaches, both in high school and college and, and professionally. Um, and yeah, they certainly guide you along the way. And it makes sense to listen to them because otherwise you're just stuck in your own head. Right. Uh, right. What was your what was your major um, event, though? What was the major event? Was it a mile or, or did it change to 10K? Ref refresh me on that. Yeah. One. Yeah. So in high school, it was the two mile. And so I won the state championship. Uh, by a, like a tenth of a second in high school uh, in Virginia. Uh, in college, you move up. And so it was the 5,000 meters and the 10,000 meters, which is 6.5, 3.1 and 6.2 miles, respectively. And then professionally, I ultimately ran the marathon. In fact, my, my last marathon, as you know, was in your hood, was in, was in New York City. I ran the Olympic trials there. And then uh, my final race was the New York City Marathon the following year. Right. Let's go back for a second. You got recruited. That took. Uh, you got recruited. Did you go on any any cool visits? You go to any schools that um, you know Division One schools that uh, kind of wind and dined, even though it was a track and field, because obviously not the you know the basketball teams. You think the football obviously throw a lot of money at everybody. But uh, do you have any good uh, recollections about some of those visits? Yeah, for those of them that I that I remember, I mean, these were these were <laughs> these are the first time that I was, you know, engaged in any sort of party atmosphere, really. And right. uh, whether that was, uh, you know, William and Mary, obviously, I had a great time there. That's where I ended up going. Uh, it was largely due to the coach and the team. Um, and the fact, it was a good school. You know, um, I had a fabulous time in Tennessee. Uh, those those volunteers know how to throw a great party. Oh, that's right. I remember that. I mean, it was okay. unreal. It was actually the year that they had just won the college football championship. Oh, geez. Um, and so they were just coming off of the, the glory days there. Um, where else did I go? I went to Princeton, which was one of my kind of final two choices there. And uh, obviously beautiful campus, amazing reputation, all that. Uh, and then I went to American. I'm trying to think in of Washington, right? American in Washington, Washington DC there, right. that's right. Yeah. Okay, it's kind of still in your backyard. So I guess um, you didn't have to, you didn't drive down to uh, Tennessee in that gold painted car you had, right? Oh, God. Want to talk yeah, about right. you want to, yeah, I, I mean, I, but I think it was have something to do with Steve Prefontaine, correct? That well, was Prefontaine, yeah. Grandpa Jerry had a, a Chevrolet Beretta. Do you remember that thing? Yeah, it was black originally, correct. Yeah, it was, it was originally black. I don't know that it was ever necessarily painted gold, but it was more rust and off and the, <laughs> and the, the window wouldn't shut and it was leaking it. all the time. And it, I think in order to actually have the ignition turn over, you had to like have the car moving. It was such a dump. <laughs> And, and it required you to put oil in it every single time you got, you, you added gas. Sounds about uh, right. And if you didn't put oil in, I mean, the thing burns so hot. I think I just burned the whole engine out within like uh, two years, a year and a half or something like that. Um, and yeah, yeah, I had one of those vanity plates um, as well, which is pretty embarrassing, but it said pre-fry. So like pre-Fontaine was, right. was like my idol. He was your um, man right now. At the time. Oh yeah. yeah tell us who Steve Prefontaine was uh, tell, for people that don't know. Yeah. So Prefontaine was this epic figure that was, uh, you know, he, he, he held all of these American records for distance running, but what made him really famous was his guts. He was this beautifully charismatic figure uh, that people wanted to be around and ex excited people and, and, and inspired people. And ultimately he died in a car crash um, at a very young age. So it's like that classic kind of only the good die young James Dean scenario. Um, but right now, believe it or not, his poster and quote is sits right above where Frida, our eight month old baby sleeps. And so when we were transitioning Fantastic. the nursery, I was like, you know what, this is a good, lesson to live by um uh which is some you know guts quote or something yeah 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 i'm glad i did my homework excellent That's right excellent. i know but i do remember that so um you got close to the olympics in pretty close what made you basically retire from you know competing running wise where where did that pivotal moment come in that kind of changed your life i know you went to law school at villanova so we know that and then um so you went from basically uh, Villanova Law School. How did you settle in Minneapolis and what was that pivotal moment that kind of changed yeah. your life? Well, my goal, my entire running career was to represent Team USA. 
I want it to be able to wear red, white, and blue. And there's a special tingle that you get when you're running for USA that you don't necessarily have if you're running for Nike or Saucony or Brooks. And uh, I ran the Twin Cities Marathon, which was the US championship that year. And I qualified for the Pan American Games, which is like the Olympics for this half of the world. Okay. And I remember the day that they told me that I had qualified for the team. Uh, arguably more importantly, I remember the day that I got this big ass box in the mail <laughs> delivered to my parents' home in Oakton, Virginia. And I opened it up and there, along with all the other gear was a USA jersey. I mean, I don't think I took the thing off for the next three weeks. I was so happy. I, I, that was like one of the happiest, Goosebumps, right? happiest moments of my entire life. But you know, my goal was not just to compete for USA, it was to compete well. And oftentimes, you know, people in their running career, they'll get to the big race and then they blow it. They'll get to that most important one. And so I, what I'm proud of is the moments the, of my running career that mattered most. The two times that I ran for Team USA were also the two best runs of my entire life races or training or anything. I mean, I ran at the Pan American Games. I was ranked like, I don't know, last or third to last out of, you know, 30 some. I finished fourth, just, just out of the medals. Um, and, then, uh, and then I raced again uh, for Team USA in the Austin Marathon, which is the international team challenge. And we beat Kenya and I won. Uh, and so after that, after I had ran for Team USA, competed sec successfully wearing the jersey, that's all I really wanted to do. And so the passion was very much gone. Uh, but additionally, I'll tell you, I didn't have as great of a shot at making the Olympic team. And I knew that, you know, I was ranked 10th in the country um, for the marathon. And in order to make the Olympics, you gotta be top three. And the difference between me at 10th place and the fifth best runner was actually relatively substantial. Sure. Uh, and it wasn't something I knew at that point where I could like, train my way in. I was already training harder than, than most of, of the other athletes, but it was a matter of, of just, you know, the, of, of talent. At sheer that point. Yeah. The gift, the sheer the gift. gift, talent. The gift. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing. And I, I mean, do don't get me it. wrong. I, I had enough of a gift. I was the 10th best in the country. Obviously. I'm not complaining or Obviously. anything, but like, right. but, but these, some of these guys that were coming up at the time uh, that were younger than me. So, you know, distance runners peak, is for men, you know, it's oftentimes around 30 years old or something. Now I stopped running when I was like 27 or 28 or somewhere in that range. So I arguably wasn't even at my peak yet, but still these guys that were younger than me, they were more talented. They had, you know, longer legs and more fluid strides and all the rest. Um, no, they were, they were kicking my butt. Right. Um, and so the, the writing was very much on the wall at the same time. And that made me, made it a little easier for me to transition to what was next, which was law. I, I was, I was becoming a lawyer at the time. Um, I got a job, uh, at a law firm out in Minneapolis and, and I moved out here and, and started my life. So you get into politics. Uh, how did you get into politics? Let's first tackle that. Yeah. So I always knew that I wanted to be involved in community work. Uh, I knew that, I could, could pursue that community work in part through the law, which was my profession at the time. Civil rights, correct? Yeah, well, I started off doing business litigation. And, mm -hmm. and, but while I was at that larger firm, Fagri, I, I had a case where I was representing a, a, a guy exactly my age who was on death row. And his name was BJ, uh, a black guy from Alabama. Uh, and no doubt in my mind that he was on death row because he was black. Um, and so I represented him and, and obviously got pretty passionate about that. There were a number of other issues that I started to get into as well. Marriage equality was a big one. We started a race that raised a whole bunch of money and, and got a lot of volunteer support for pushing for marriage equality and against this really hateful constitutional amendment that had come out at the time. I did some work on the north side of our city around um, some of the housing issues following a tornado literally ripping through that that area of our of our of our city and i started to realize that my passion more and more was in public service and um you know brought a team together i ran against an incumbent for the third ward and won uh and then uh championed a number of issues uh most notably in the area of affordable housing uh, and ran for mayor and won again uh, and you know, the, the, the rest is, is history, I guess, but it's been a, it's been a, it's been a time and a lot of transitions in the, 
in the meantime. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, so you put forth uh, your, your, you know, your greatest strength, which was, you know, passion and, 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 and dedication uh, to trying to help better uh, communities and, and, and people. Uh, did you have any idea what to expect as a politician? Um, you know, listen, uh, let, we could get into a little bit again about, you know, where, where you're at now and what's gone on the last year. But, you know, did you really have any expectation at all um, being, you know, what, what it was going to be like to be involved in politics and as legitimate, you know, uh, politician? I think I had a pretty good feel for how public service would be in 2018 and 2019. Okay. I don't think I had any idea well, who could. The, the unprecedented nature of 2020. And if anybody tells you that they fully expected it, they are full of it. Of course. Um, I mean, I don't think I said the word pandemic when I was running for election a single time. Um, I don't think I had any idea that that pandemic would be lopped on top of uh, numerous other difficulties and controversies and crises that have, have hit our city in this last year, from George Floyd's murder to the unrest that we experienced, to an economic downturn and a city budgetary crisis. There have been so many. Um, and that scope and number of crises that were sandwiched on top of one another, no, I, I don't think anybody fully anticipated that. But you know, you, you, you have to keep moving forward. And you keep putting one step in front of the other and you tell the truth and you try and do the right thing, which is oftentimes up for debate. And that's what you can do. I want to kind of get a little deep into your psychic a little bit because, um, you know, this past year, you know, you probably learned a ton because people might be interested in, in, uh, in hearing, you know, what, you know, Jacob Fry, the human, not Jacob Fry, the politician, because we know, you know, listen, that's a game. Everybody, you got to play. We know that's your job, you know? 10 o'clock at night, 10, 30, 11, you know, you get up, you go to the refrigerator for a second, you take a, a, a drink out and you're staring out the window. You, you know, you're just thinking, what do you got? Okay, give me, give, give me something here. Yeah, paint me well, a, pay me a Picasso. Paint you, a, paint you a picture of what it was like. Um, well, first I'll say that you have to keep reminding yourself as difficult as it is that it's not about you. You know, it's, it's these 400 years worth of injustice. It's all these different systemic issues. But at the same time, as you pointed out, yeah, in many respects, I was at the center and can, we continue collectively as a city to be at the center of this like hundred years in the making racial reckoning that we're experiencing right now. Uh, but since you asked about me specifically and how it was, look, man, it was horrible. Uh, it was absolutely horrible. It was it was it was tough. It was it was painful. And you know, I, I recognize that that this last year, the pain has far more been acutely felt by our black community. And so again, I'll preface it: it ain't about me. Um, but yeah, you know, Sarah was a was rock solid. She has a backbone of steel, and was you know helping to pick me back up and put me together each night at you know 9 30 10 whenever it is so that you can get back up the next morning and keep trying to uh, make progress in the city uh you know you also realize a lot more about yourself through these times and you know you've you've known me since i was zero you've known me as an awkward nine-year-old you've, you've known me as a as a relatively nutty teenager um and you probably also know that I usually operate with quite a bit of, of confidence and you, you, you operate with this kind of almost aura or protection, um, which is the protection of other people having said, hey, you did this well. Hey, great, you did a good grade on that paper. You, you congratulations on winning that race. You're really tough. Um, way to go get into that great school, whatever it is. And you, you, you develop kind of an armor of confidence that you feel that you can go into almost any situation and have the ability to get the job done. And you know that, that was kind of a, just a utter belief in yourself that, that is something that I've always had. And you know, cocky, fine, confidence, whatever you wanna call it. But especially through a circumstance like this, where there is so much coming at you from every single side, 
And the situation is so far beyond at times what one person or even a whole enterprise can handle. Um, you know, that, that armor, it does get worn away. Uh, and you start to realize, um, you start, what you start to do is just press everything else aside and you look at the issue that is before you and you just make several commitments to yourself. You say, okay, I'm gonna wake up in the morning and I'm gonna tell the truth. No matter what, I'm gonna tell the truth. I'm gonna try and do what's right. And oftentimes that's up for debate. Correct. Uh, and you're gonna do everything possible to, to protect the city. And like literally other than those core and functional things, like a lot of the politics, the, the, the armor, the so much of the rest kind of goes out the window. Um, but you know, to answer your question, it was hard because you know I had a very pregnant wife who was studying for the bar exam at the time. Um, we were you know, on the verge of having our first child in September. We had people that were often protesting outside our home. Uh, and then simultaneously, you gotta keep doing the work of, of a very important job that I love. Um, even in some of the darkest times, um, you still recognize the need for that fundamental service to, to, to a city that really was going through a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. You know, I, I will say something, you know, obviously, you know, I'm a, we're on the outside, the whole country was on the whole, the world world was on the outside, you know, watching and, um, you know, you kind of put it just now in the way where uh, you kind of stripped it down and, and made it real, you know, for us and for people. And uh, I did, I did see you speak recently um, after the governor. It was a couple of weeks ago. It might have been a month or so ago. And um, I will say, I'll give you props for this. Uh, you look like you, um, not, I'm not going to say you're weathered in any way, but you know, you, you, you took a step, you, you got a little, uh, what's the word I want to say? Uh, maybe a little tougher, a little thicker, a little com more confident. I think it only comes with experience and age. There's nothing you can do. You know, you, yeah. ha you had no choice but to, like you said, you know, the race is going to start. You have to compete. You have to get in there. And one of the main things is uh, your core belief. You know, you got to tell the truth. You know, you got to yep. tell the truth and go by what you feel. You know, how, 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 you know, how did the media, you know, I'm not saying take a shot or I'm not, I'm not, I'm looking for positive, negative, but you know, you have to, is the media uh, a very, very vibrant and tough force, even in, you know, a smaller city versus, uh, you know, New York or LA or Chicago, you know, I mean, I'm sure it was coming out hard all over the place, especially with social media as well. What was that like? You were able to uh, deal with it. You did you, did you, you know, just look at some of the stuff and, or just keep it to the side. You, you kept it at bay. How did you handle that? No, I mean, the hardest part is when there's either misinformation out there that just quite simply isn't true. You know, I mean, and I remember looking back to the unrest following George Floyd's murder. And, you know, it wasn't a matter of planning uh, or preparation. It was just simple math. We did not have the numbers to be able to handle what we were experiencing. And that's one of the hardest things is to, is, you know, as we were waiting on assistance from some other jurisdictions to come in and, you know, the National Guard hadn't quite gotten there yet and the state patrol was not in town. Um, the reality is we just did not have the personnel. Right. Um, and there's, there's, there's nothing that you can say in those horrible moments that'll reassure people uh, when you're in those very grave and difficult circumstances. Uh, and so look, my, my foundational thing was just tell the truth, which I did. Yeah, 100%, um, 100%. You know, uh, uh, but at, at, at the same time, you know, I'm the mayor and you're also responsible you, and it's, and you're, even if it's not all on you, given the circumstances were so unprecedented, uh, it's also your responsibility to get the city through regardless. And you are held accountable for the results. And I Absolutely. get that and I yeah. own that. Yeah. And I'll say, you know, I, you know, you also learn a lot. And I mean, I, I feel like over this last year, I've grown as a mayor. I like to think that I've grown as a person and you use those experiences going forward. And, you know, I've sure I've got, a few more gray hairs and quite a few more crow's feet. But, uh, you know, those, those 
you know, battle wounds, if you will, hopefully can be used for good progress going forward. hundred percent. Absolutely. How's the city today? I mean, I know, you know, the last couple of weeks were uh, with the, with the verdict and, um, Obviously, there were just things popping at all times, but how, how, how's, the, how's the city, how's the feel of the city, you know, today, in 2021? I mean, uh, pandemic is easing up quite a bit there, right? Um, people are coming back out and, and the restaurants are getting, are getting filled again. So how, how is the city today? I mean, there are multiple truths associated with where the city is right now. I think it, it is coming back to life. I mean, restaurants are opening. People are giving each other a hugs again, which they haven't done for a long time. There's this level of like of, of interaction and love that's on the street that hasn't been there for quite some time simply because people are able to interact again. And that in and of itself is a beautiful thing. Right. Um, you know, and... And you know, now that we're we're moving past COVID, gradually but surely, we're we're opening things up. I mean, you see a vibrancy on the street that hasn't been there in quite some time, and there's certainly a lot of demand for people to be with each other again. Um, now, simultaneously, we've got safety concerns. You know, we've got ki little kids that have gotten shot. We've got families that have forever been changed uh, due to some of the gun violence that we're seeing in Minneapolis. And I know we're not unique. New York City is experiencing a pretty Absolutely. major uptick in violence as well. Correct. Um, Chicago, I mean, you name it, every city throughout the country is seeing these trends take place. And so it's it's both fulfilling and really heavy at the same time uh, in, in the present state. And, you know, I, I think you know, we all need to be able to to understand and acknowledge these multiple truths at the same time. Uh, and whether that's the nature of Minneapolis as a city, an amazing place with extraordinary people that also has many shortcomings, um, or it's our present state. Um, and so often right now, given the way like social media operates or the, or, or the news even, you know, it's these sound bites and these headlines and these hashtags that don't paint the full picture necessarily and cause people to go into these camps where they're only dealing in absolutes all bad, all good, you know? And it's never the truth. The truth is more difficult. The truth is more complex and far more gray. Interesting, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a good term actually, you know, a multiple truths. It's interesting, mm -hmm. you know? It's true. It, it, it is, that's really, I, I kind of like that. That's great. Uh, if you could go on a run mm -hmm. with one person from any point in history, Ooh. Who might it be, or anybody that comes to your mind? With that, it doesn't have to be any point in history. Anybody, you know, anybody come to your mind? And good question, right? Not bad. It is a good question. You know, um, well, since I'm on the call with you right now, and given that this is my perfect scenario where the individual could actually run, let alone walk. Uh, I'm going with Grandma Dell. I'm going wow. with your mom. You know, I mean, she she was always a person that was just chock full of wisdom. She t told you like it is. Um, you know, a, a tried and true New Yorker and a teacher, and you know, some of the the, the best lessons that I've gotten in life were from from Grandma Dell. Um, Adele, wow. by the way, but you know, you yeah, shorten yeah. it when you're calling your grandma. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, no, I, th I think, it, I think it would be her, but you know, I, I never barely saw her walk to the mailbox, let alone go for a run. So I don't yeah, know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's true. She would, That's she true. would take her car out to go to the, to go to temple, which was like four blocks away or something. <laughs> no doubt about it. No doubt. So for, for tourists coming to the Minneapolis, give, give us, give us a shout out of a place, uh, or I mean, I mean, if you're allowed, what are some of the good spots to hit in, in Minneapolis that people are, uh. Yeah. could look forward to you got anything good are you allowed, well, you know, are you allowed Cuzzy's, to say that yeah i mean cuzzy's is a classic and you're you're wearing a classic shirt there right now and um i you know i haven't been back there and but that is a, a cuzzy's is definitely a classic and um you know one where where sarah and i have been going a whole lot recently is fema's downtown um really great joint is this is sephardic jew that runs the place and so, you know, with Sephardic Judaism, it's like this weird combination of Moroccan and Jewish and French and uh, whatever, but it's a really good vibe there, good drinks, all the rest. Pimento, if you like good Jamaican food, jerk chicken, 
excellent. Cool. It's, it's just a legendary spot right now. Um, so I don't know, there's, there's a few good ones. It depends what you're in the mood for, but um, you know, we, uh, I'll tell you, uh, Louis, we also have got bagels too. Now, I mean, come, I don't, I don't on, know that on, we're stop, at, stop, stop, we, stop. we have, we, I mean, you know, I, I don't know if there's bagel oasis or anything. You but, drink, uh, you're drinking, you're drinking the Kool-Aid, right? Yeah, yeah, right. You are drinking the Kool-Aid, pal. <laughs> Is the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, ship some of the New York water out. And I know that's right. like the, the claim exactly. as to why the bagels are so good there, but we got, wow. we got good water here. We have good yeah. water. It's yeah, hold on a second. Hold on, hold on a second. Hold on. Yeah, don't worry. I'll, I'll edit that. Don't worry. Anyway, yeah. uh, <laughs> what are some of the main concerns that you, you see going forward on, on, on running now on the next round? Well, the decision to run again for re-election was a much longer conversation, certainly with Sarah, than it normally is. And it's, um, right. And, you know, we make the decision together, given that it really is a joint effort and it impacts our whole family. And, you know, normally it's when you make a decision to run, it's, it's you know, what's the big vision? What's the coalition you're going to build? And, right. And, but, but right now, it's feeling this very deep-seated responsibility to get the city through this. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't, I take that very seriously. I, I take that responsibility, uh, very seriously. And I mean, with respect to the election law, it's looking good. You know, we are, we're very strong right now. Um, locking up a series of endorsements from our attorney general, uh, Keith Ellison, who actually handled the Derek Chauvin murder Absolutely. case, Absolutely. uh, to, uh, asked me, just endorsed us yesterday, and that one particularly meant a lot to me, just because these are, you know, the employees that we work with at City Hall. Right. To have their support means the world. Um, and, you know, it's 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 looking good, it's feeling good, and we've got, I think, a strong message that is based in honesty. You know, I I, I think there are plenty of candidates out there that'll just say, hey, this, do this, say that, uh, abolish this, change this, and then suddenly it's all good that's just not the reality of these situations. And it doesn't outline the true complexities of actually being mayor. This is Absolutely. a tough job. And you know, a big part of it is having the courage to stand your ground when you're getting hit from all different directions. It's, it's having the, the conviction to stick with your principles, uh, even uh, when you're getting pounded on a little bit, you know? And, and in so many respects, being mayor is you're also, you're also, dealing with all of these issues that nobody else wants to deal with. And so you know, issues that don't want to be handled by the feds are passed down to the state. They don't want to be handled by the state, they're passed down to cities. And then we are the ones, uh, mayors largely, that are trying to figure out how to deal with all these shortcomings of society. Yeah, it all comes down to the local. It all comes down to the local. Absolutely. All comes down and it all, yeah. it all comes to yeah. a head. And that's both it's both what makes the job hard, but it's also what I love about it because you get to dig into this, these very thorny, difficult issues. Well, you know, that's a great way to tie it up because, I, you know, glad we could go circle back to the way you started running. You started putting uh, both feet in, digging in, complete diligent. I mean, really, really, really dedicated. And, and I, you know, you come across as you, you know, you really want to, you want to help. You want to help. Not only do you want to help and do the right thing and help everybody, but I, I think you actually, you know, ca besides caring, you believe you might be able to. This is what's so, this is a beautiful thing. You, you really do, or the way it's conveyed to me and maybe to, I'm hoping to everybody else out there is that, you know, you, the message you're conveying is that, you know, you do really care. You can help. It's not just me, everybody. We have to be in this together. You need the team. You need the cooperation. You need people. There are multiple truths here. There are multiple falsehoods that come on the other side that need to be bridged. And that in a nutshell, you know, I'm going to go back and say it. I mean, you, yeah, you, you are a mensch, you know, you really are. It's amazing. My nephew or not. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, I got to tell you, really, I mean, uh, well, I, I went from like a, a loser at the beginning of the podcast <laughs> now to a to a mensch at the end, regardless, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, yeah, uh, yeah. no, it's it's well, you know, uh, right. I, I don't know. I, I have to come back on the show more often, I guess, because you're, you're giving me a little bit of juice back here, Uncle Louie. I hope so. I hope so. I, I want to say thank you, brother, so, so, so much. Uh, I can't tell you how honored I am. 
and appreciative that you actually took the time to, you know, speak candidly, really, you know, again, what you, I know this, what you see is what you get. And that's what's so amazing about, you know, about you, you know, you're right. You gotta, you gotta come across, you gotta talk a certain way. You have to promote, you have to uh, be a certain personality, but this is really, this is you. This has always been you. And I, I only wish you and Sarah, Frida, and everybody that, that touches you, uh, let, let them get touched by you. You touch them. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, Minneapolis will, uh, and the whole, really the whole country will, will take a look and see, because, you know, you know, you, we've watched you for the last couple of years and, um, you know, I love you, man, but it's really, uh, you really, really, really uh, have, have done a, a, a tremendous, tremendous job. And I, and I want to thank you so, so much. For it. Thank you, Uncle Louie. L- love you. Love to the whole family as well. Indoors, please.